Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daniel Kurtzer. I teach here at the Woodrow Wilson School, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you to an event that uh, was conceived, and we owe thanks to uh, Elizabeth Donahue and Patty Yelovich. We spend a lot of time talking about issues in the Middle East, and uh, it occurred to them and to us uh, some time ago that uh, we really needed to step back and understand uh, better uh, one of the most important relationships in this region, and that is within Islam itself, uh, the various uh, strands of Islam and how they uh, interact and relate and sometimes don't. Uh, when thinking about this and thinking about the people who might address this, we had our wish list and then we had our secondary list and we were fortunate to get our wish list. The two absolute best people who could address this subject and I'm very happy to uh, welcome uh, Genevieve Abdo and to say hello to our colleague at Princeton, uh, Bernie Haeckel. Uh, Genevieve Abdo is a fellow in the Middle East program at the Stimson Center and a non-resident fellow at uh, the Saban Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings. Research focuses on modern Iran and political Islam. She also co-chairs a program on Iran <clears throat> in conjunction with the Heinrich Bell Stiftung, North America, and is a prolific author, including No God But God, Egypt and the Triumph of Islam in the year 2000, and a co-author of Answering Only to God, Faith and Freedom in 21st Century Iran. Most recently, I think, Mecca and Main Street, Muslim Life in America after 9-11. Uh, Bernard Haeckel is a professor of Near Eastern Studies uh, here at Princeton and director of the Trans-Regional Institute for the Study of the Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia. His primary research interests center on Islamic political movements and legal thought, currently studies the history and politics of the Arabian Peninsula and Islamism. He has also published extensively, uh, including on the Salafi movement in both its pre-modern and modern manifestations. He's the author of Revival and Reform in Islam, the Legacy of Muhammad al shalkani published in 2003, and is completing a book on the religious politics of Saudi Arabia since the 1950s, which will be published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, Genev will speak first, and then uh, uh, Bernie, and then we'll have a chance for everyone to ask questions. As we do, I would ask uh, students to come first to the microphone when we're finished, and then uh, we'll be able to accommodate also members of the community. Genev, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Ambassador Kurtzer, for that nice introduction. And um, we've been tasked this evening to try to do perhaps the impossible, which is to bring clarity to a very complicated topic. Um, and so I hope that when the, even, the next hour is over, you feel much more informed. Um, I'm going to begin by trying to present an overview of the subject. Um, and then I will detail the situation in specific countries, particularly Syria, because I'm sure that most of you read in the newspapers every day about the conflict in Syria. Um, so what we have seen in recent years since the Arab uprising happened is sort of a, the increase or the escalation of the conflict between Shia and Sunni Muslims. And even though this has been, this, this religious and political difference has been a marker of identity in, I'll speak specifically about the Arab world, in the Arab world for centuries, it reignited for a lot of specific and particular reasons since the up, uprisings began. And before I get to those reasons, I will just define for you in very general terms what the difference is between a Shia and a Sunni Muslim. So the conflict actually goes back to 1400 years, shortly after the death of the prophet Muhammad. And the conflict stems over who should be his replacement. So who should be represent and be the leader of the community of believers. The Shias believed that the leader should come among the prophet's relatives. And the Sunnis believed that the leader should be elected, which in fact, is what came to be, the leader was elected, and the, the, and the leaders for the years that followed. However, this conflict has really shaped and characterized this 
theological and also political difference. And so for all these years, there's been this historical strife between Shia and Sunni Muslims. And I want to also note that the uh, percentage of Shia Muslims throughout the world is only 10 to 13% compared with the majority of Sunni Muslims. And what's interesting about the fact that the Shia are the minority is that recently um, a research center in Washington, the Pew Forum, did extensive surveys um, both in 2011 and 2012. And interestingly enough, even though the Shia are a minority among Muslims, the surveys found that it was the Shia who were less concerned about this sectarian conflict than the Sunni. So that was very interesting, and I think that it speaks to events that have happened since the Arab uprising began. So what we have now in the Middle East is in, in most countries, in Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and even Egypt, which has almost, you couldn't even really quantify the Shia population. There are so few in numbers. Now sectarianism is a big issue, and it is, it is to some degree defining the political context in these countries. Um, the war in Syria, although this, the new sectarian conflict began with Iraq, it began when um, not only the United States invaded, but it even began before that when Saddam Hussein was in power, this sort of new characterization of the sectarian conflict. But now it is Syria, actually, that is the central narrative and the prism through which Muslim communities sort of define themselves and also are in conflict. Um, I, this is particularly true um, in Lebanon. Um, it's also true in Yemen. But in Lebanon, a country that I visit quite often and I just came from recently, what has happened as a result of the war in Syria is that the northern part of Lebanon, which is, has been pretty much the center of the Shia-Sunni conflict, the, the, the conflict in this area is a complete response to what is happening in Syria. So I'll just give you a specific example. I went and visited um, a sheikh at a mosque that was bombed in um, August. And he was, he's a Sunni and what we call Salafist figure, cleric. And his mosque was bombed because he uses the, the mosque as a platform to, to preach against the Shia. He's a Sunni, so to preach against the Shia in his mosque. And he talks about how uh, President Assad has killed tens of thousands of Sunni Muslims. And as a result of these very repetitive Friday prayer sermons, his mosque was targeted, presumably, by Alawites living in Lebanon. Now, the Alawites are uh, a sect of Shia Islam. And so they're natural. They have not a natural affinity, but a more modern affinity with the, uh, Assad. The, the, the Alawites and the, and the Shia have sort of now a, a, an affinity. That hasn't always been true historically, but it is now as a result of the war in Syria and also the, the relationship with Iran. But so his mosque was attacked and he was targeted. They tried, the Alawites tried to assassinate him because of his constant preaching in the mosque against the Shia, with whom the Alawites have an affinity. And so I asked him, and I think that this is a good example of the escalation of the sectarian conflict. So I asked him, well, is this going to deter you in the future? Are you going to try to be more tolerant in your mosque toward the Shia? And he said, no, this is the reason that we all need to go and fight in Syria, us Sunnis, and we need to try in some way to topple Assad's regime. <clears throat> so I think the point is that as time goes on and as the war in Syria deepens, the sectarian divide deepens not only in Lebanon but in neighboring countries. Um, one, there are several causes for the deepening of this conflict. And I think that the question that many people ask is, well, if this conflict has been going on for 1,400 years, why is it escalating now? And I think one of the reasons is the weakening of states. So before the Arab uprisings, when you had authoritarian governments in place, and you still do in, in the Gulf, in the Persian Gulf, um, and I'm sure that Professor Haeckel will speak more specifically about the Gulf, but when you have authoritarian states in power, it's not that this conflict somehow vanishes or evaporates, but it's that there's a strong state structure. And that discourages, particularly when you have a country like Iraq, that discourages these kinds of uh, 
identity politics or sectarian identities from becoming prominent. And this was certainly the case in Iraq. Now, in the case of a country like Lebanon and Yemen, which have a history of weak states, there's been an ongoing sectarian conflict. For example, in Lebanon, there was a, a civil war uh, in, in, in Lebanon from 1975 to 1991. That's how long the war lasted. And it, it involved a lot of sex. And why is that the case? Because of weak states. So we see that from recent history, as, as recently as two years ago, as well as even from the 1970s, in the case of Lebanon, weak states tend to be a cause for the escalation of this sectarian conflict. Today, the other reason, another reason is that in some of these countries, there is what we call a proxy war between, uh, among states. So, for example, when the Bahraini uprising began in 2011, Saudi Arabia shortly thereafter um, sent troops in to try to quell the uprising to support the government of Bahrain. And in other countries as well, Saudi Arabia is another example, um, Lebanon is another example, Syria is certainly an example. You have Iran and Saudi Arabia and other countries that have now become key players in either funding uh, groups or providing military assistance to groups. Syria is a perfect example of that. You have Iran now directly involved in the war in Syria. You have the Saudis supporting Salafist, jihadist groups in Syria. And you have Hezbollah, which is the Iranian-backed uh, organization in Lebanon, also supporting Assad. So in a sense, you have two different sort of situations evolving. You have a situation on the state level, which is sectarian in its orientation, and then you have uh, the conflict on the grassroots level, which is also to some degree driven by sectarianism that is a grab for political power, but it's also about religious difference. And what I have found in um, my recent interviews over the last two years in the Middle East, um, I published a, a monograph with the Brookings Institution on this, this sectarian divide. What I have found is that as we get deeper into these conflicts, there is a perception of what is happening on the state level. So people perceive that these countries I mentioned, including the United States, are taking sides. And that also fuels this sectarian difference. So the, the, in the example of Syria, there's a lot of animosity, of course, toward Iran among the Sunnis. There's a lot of animosity among the Shia toward Saudi Arabia. Um, and interestingly enough, in this last trip, when I uh, was interviewing the Salafists in Lebanon, this, these perceptions change. So the drivers of the conflict are these perceptions that I'm talking about that derive from what people are per perceiving as the proxy war, but they shift. So when I went to interview some of the Salafists, the Sunnis in northern Lebanon, now they think because of the nuclear talks in which the United States is trying to negotiate um, a deal on the nuclear issue with Iran, they, their perception is that the United States was supporting the Sunnis because they supported the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, but now has switched sides and is now supporting the Shia. So there's a lot of animosity now in northern Lebanon against the United States because they perceive that the United States has switched sides and is now also more or less acquiesce, acquiescing to the fact that, that the Assad regime in the short term will probably remain in power in Syria. So they believe that the United States that once supported the Muslim Brotherhood, a Sunni group, has now shipped sides. And I thought that that was a very interesting sort of change in, in, in the dynamics of the region. Um, another driver, I think, for the sectarianism now is, as I mentioned, the religious discourse. Um, and this is particularly true on the, Sunni, on the Sunni side. You have now, as I mentioned earlier, the mosques that have become a platform for discussing this conflict. And it's not only true in Lebanon, it's, it's true in many other countries. And it's also true in, in um, social media. And social media is playing quite a role in driving this, this animosity and this sectarianism. And as part of the monograph that I published with Brookings, I went back, for example, and I studied the leading, leading uh, sheikh in, in Bahrain to try to understand what the religious discourse was before the uprising began in Bahrain and after the uprising. And like, much like Syria, in Bahrain, 
in the beginning, in the early days of the uprising, it was less sectarian than it became over time. So in the beginning, the reasons for the uprisings were focused on long-standing grievances of the Shia population, which is very much marginalized in, in Bahrain. They aren't entitled to government positions as the Sunnis are. Shia doctors have to practice in separate hospitals. They're not allowed equal university education. So the whole socioeconomic opportunities for the Shia is much more disadvantaged than for the Sunnis. And so in the beginning of the uprising, there was very much, uh, there was some support among the Sunni for the Shia who were leading the uprising. But over time, because of this sectarian narrative, there is now a very polarized society. And because governments, as I mentioned, governments have, are capitalizing on the sectarianism, much of the Bahraini society now believes that this conflict is about sectarianism. It's not about, in their mind, the, the original uh, reasons, which were the grievances for more uh, social and political rights among the, Sunni pop among the Shia population. So I so in, go, in using this political context, I went and examined some of the religious discourse. And it was very interesting because while the society to some degree, particularly young groups, were becoming more radicalized, the, the clerics in the Shia mosques were trying to calm the situation. So there was, there was one cleric in particular, Isa Qasim. And I, I looked back at some of his Friday prayer sermons before the uprisings began, and they were much more radical. He talked about Iran, he talked about very, he gave very anti-American speeches. After the uprising began, began, when the government was trying to convince everyone that it was about sectarianism, in fact, the, the Shia clerics <clears throat> began to, to become much more rational, much more reasonable in their religious discourse. So, while religious discourse can be a radicalizing factor in all of this, it can also be somewhat of a moderating force. And I think that that's what we have seen, or at least an attempt in Bahrain. In some of the Sunni mosques in uh, countries such as Lebanon, that's not the case. And in, um, in analyzing the religious discourse um, among some of the clerics of the Sunnis, they talk about the Shia as as literally as dogs. I mean, that's how they refer to them in some of the mosques in Lebanon. They don't even consider Shia as real Muslims. Um, and this is not only true in Lebanon, it's also been a discussion in Egypt, where as I mentioned, a very small percentage of the population are, sh are Shia. You have Salafists there, some of whom are clerics, uh, basically it, it, sort of warning the population that the Shia are trying to come to Egypt to convert the majority Sunni population to Shiism, which is absolutely false, but this is their perception of what they believe is happening. And to some degree, as I mentioned, this is the, some of these more distorted ideas are a result of a perception that Iran has some sort of grand political, geopolitical strategy in the Middle East and is trying to now sort of become powerful uh, within Sunni states, and that's sort of some of the perception among the Sunnis, which is driving this sectarianism. Um, I will conclude by just mentioning that, um, that the, the United States is in a very precarious situation now. Um, even though the United States is not directly involved necessarily in these conflicts, the because of this sectarianism, there are a lot of very negative perceptions now about the United States and the role that it's playing in the region. So in, as someone who works in Washington, it's always sort of interesting for me to um, participate in all of these discussions about the United States needing, or, you know, that the, the, the Arab societies are relying on the United States to do X, Y, and Z. They're relying on the United States to try to sort out Syria. They're relying on the United States to sort out Egypt. In fact, in the region, to some degree, it's the opposite, that many, in many Arab societies, they want, they prefer less involvement from the United States. That's sort of a result of their misperception of the United States objectives and their misperceptions of what the United States is really doing in these countries, but it's also a fear that the United States will try to tip this balance, this sectarian balance, in either the, fa in either the favor of the Shia or the Sunni. So it's, it's sort of interesting to, to observe, you know, how the United States role is being perceived in the region.
Um, and the whole negotiations with Iran have really sort of changed people's perceptions of where the United States stands, which is, is very interesting because, of course, historically, I mean, the United States has never really had a, a very good relationship with Iran. And so, but, but in the region, it's being perceived as sort of the opposite, that the United States is now moving in the direction of, of the Shia. Um, the last comment I will make is that another um, observation that I've made is that for some Gulf states, democracy, or what we believe to be democracy, free elections, is considered a subversive idea. Because in many Gulf states, the Sunnis are the majority, or, or in, in a state like Bahrain, the Sunnis are not the majority, they're the minority. So they don't want free elections. They don't want democratic governance, the government of Bahrain, because the Shia are the majority of the population. So as part of the sectarian conflict, it's sort of interesting how very different views of, of democracy have emerged, especially in the Gulf. Uh, democracy has become a very negative idea simply because um, uh, Sunni populations fear that the Shia could come to power as they have in Iraq. And this is a fear among certainly the, the monarchies of, of uh, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. And so I'll leave it to that and turn it over to Professor Hagel. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I've been given 15 minutes and I would like to thank Ambassador Kurtzer for the kind introduction. So as uh, was mentioned just now, the difference uh, between the Shia and the, Sun, uh, the Sunnah or the Sunnis and the Shi'is is a difference over the succession to the Prophet, who was to succeed. Uh, that was the original difference, but over time, uh, the communities diverge. Certainly, theologically, uh, they're quite distinct. Uh, in some of their uh, religious observances and practices, they're very distinct, in fact, uh, we're just a few days from after the 10th of the month, the first month of the Muslim calendar, which is a day in Arabic called Ashura, when Shi'is commemorate the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, who was the Prophet's grandson, who was killed um, in a brutal fashion and defeated with his small band of supporters in Iraq with, uh, and by um, what would become a Sunni, one of the, you know, the principal Sunni states, the Umayyad state, so the Sunnis and Shi'is have a long history of um, difference, certainly of antagonism. The Shi'is have historically been at the receiving end of much of the uh, persecution that was uh, waged by Sunni states uh, against them. And uh, this persecution against this, the Shi'is, who, as was mentioned, are a minority in the Muslim world, uh, was never consistent. Sometimes there were very bad periods, sometimes there were uh, better periods. But over time, the Shia, the Shi'is, uh, uh, in their majority, and the Shi'is, by the way, are not just one community. They're not just one sect. They're, in fact, three sects, just to complicate things for you uh, a bit more. And it is a very complicated subject. The, the majority of the Shia uh, are known as Twelvers, or Imami Shi'is. They are a majority in Iran. In, uh, they are the largest single sect in Lebanon. They are um, the largest sect and a majority in Iraq. And they are a majority in Bahrain. And there are very sizable minorities of Shi'is in Afghanistan and Pakistan and in India, in Kuwait. Uh, and this community, the Twelver community, uh, has been historically persecuted uh, uh, like other, like the other, like uh, a number of the other Shi'is, and uh, politically developed a doctrine of quietism. Essentially, they shunned politics. Uh, they adopted a posture. They became millenarian, and or, or rather apocalyptic, in the sense that they believed in a, a Messiah. They have a Messiah doctrine that's very developed in their theology, and they considered all political uh, regimes to be illegitimate and unjust. Uh, from their point of view, the only just regime uh, was a regime that would uh, be ushered in by the return of a Messiah-like figure called the Mahdi, who is their 12th Imam, and they still wait for his return. He, they believe him to be still alive and amongst us, but to have disappeared in the ninth century, in the late ninth century of our era, uh, 
and that he is in, a, he is in what they consider to be a um, state of occultation, of hiding. Uh, the 12 the Shi'is, as I said, uh, developed this doctrine, and the majority of them still adhere to this doctrine. They still actually are not keen on getting involved in politics or uh, taking over uh, uh, as Shi'is, to taking over power as Shi'is. There is, however, a figure who emerged in the 20th century amongst the 12 er Shi'is, amongst the Imami Shi'is, again, the majority in Iran, Lebanon, Bahrain. And this is the figure of Imam Khomeini. Ayatollah Khomeini was an Iranian uh, cleric, a grand Ayatollah, uh, a very prominent scholar. And he broke with that tradition of apolitical quietism by arguing or developing a doctrine <clears throat> which basically uh, in very kind of reduced form, uh, claimed that one supreme uh, scholar should rule the state uh, in the absence of the Messiah and should be his representative. This scholar uh, should be the ruler of the state and he developed this doctrine and it is, his, it is this doctrine that is the basis for rule or at least one of the two pillars of rule of the Islamic Republic of Iran today. So the supreme leader of Iran, uh, first Ayatollah Khomeini, who died uh, in the late 80s and was replaced at the time by the present supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, he is what is known as the faqih. And he has something called wilaya. Wilaya means guardianship. And he is the uh, ruler of Iran. And any Shia outside of Iran <clears throat> who believes in this doctrine considers this person to be his leader both in spiritual matters, but also in political matters. Uh, most Shia do not believe in this doctrine. They don't accept this doctrine, uh, although some do. Certainly the core followers of the regime in Iran do, as does a movement like Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, and this person who rules in Iran uh, uh, commands their obedience. He commands the obedience of those who believe in this doctrine and who believe in him as the supreme leader. Um, so that is a major kind of uh, rupture in the Shia, in, in Shia political history that you have the development of a doctrine whereby a cleric becomes actually the ruler, the head of state. And that was never the case in Shia uh, history. Uh, Shia history is, as I said, and I will repeat to you, is dominated by an avoidance of power, an avoidance of politics, because they feel that the community can be menaced by its association with a state or with power, because sooner or later, from their bitter experience, this state will come back and persecute them. So they're very much like Jews in that sense. They have a deeply ingrained sense of persecution over centuries. Uh, and, and Khomeini is, again, this figure who is a departure from that tradition. Now, the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, is a very important country, and it's a very difficult country to apprehend or to understand because it has this dual nature or dual quality to it. On the one hand, it's a normal state with state interests, and it operates and functions like a state, and I think if I were to try to explain to you the logic of how the Islamic Republic has functioned as a state, it is essentially trying to assure its own survival as a regime. And if you are the Islamic Republic of Iran and you look, to, you look around you in the Middle East, and let's look around ourselves, let's pretend for a second we're Iran, and we're looking around, around the year 2003. What do you see? You see a very belligerent America attacking a country, a neighboring country, a much hated leadership, by the way. The Iranians detested Saddam Hussein for having invaded Iran in 1980, uh, for having brutalized his own population, and for having killed many Iranians. But they looked, to, they looked to the United States, and they saw the United States invading Iraq and smashing the regime in Iraq. They also looked right after 9-11, a couple of years earlier, and they saw the Americans come into Afghanistan and smash the regime of the Taliban. So they had the United States on either border 
on both sides of the country. And when this happened, the Iranians actually delivered, right after 9-11 and with the attack on Afghanistan, they, they were extremely supportive of America initially. They provided much of the intelligence that America used in smashing the, uh, the Taliban regime, which, by the way, is a Sunni regime. Uh, the, but they looked around, and they saw that the Americans had invaded Iraq, and they saw North Korea, a country farther to the east, which had a nuclear weapon, and which was not threatened by American power. And I think they drew a lesson from the attack of, of Iraq, that if you have nuclear weapons, if you at least develop the potential for nuclear weapons, maybe not even get them, but if you develop that potential, you might in fact secure yourself. But short of that, they also sought opportunities that availed themselves to the Iranian regime to extend their influence in order to protect themselves. So what they did was they mobilized many of their own supporters and followers and allies in Iraq so that by the time the US left Iraq, the people who were in power in Iraq, many of them were strong allies and protégés of the Iranian regime. And today, Iran holds huge influence in Iraq, in large part because of America's blunder in first attacking the country, but secondly, handing over the politics of that country to the Iranians. But they, they, there was a vacuum. And you know, whenever there's a vacuum, it attracts uh, something to fill it. And so the Iranians moved in with their allies, and they filled that vacuum. They also have had a long-standing relationship with the regime in Syria, which is a, a Alawite uh, a, a Shia regime. The Alawites are an even more complicated sect, very heretical, very outside the pale, even of Shiism. But I won't get into the details unless you want to ask me about the Alawites, whose actual name is Nusayri. Uh, they believe in a trinity. Uh, they deify the cousin of the prophet. I mean, they're a complicated community theologically. Be that as it may, the Iranians also had a strong ally and still have a strong ally in the Assad regime. And this, again, is an attempt of, for the Iranians to extend their influence in the region, ultimately to protect themselves as a state. And they also have Hezbollah in Lebanon, who are actually believers in the doctrine of Wilayat al-Faqih. They're the believers in the doctrine of Imam Khomeini. And therefore, they control the politics of Lebanon. And for a while, they even had the Palestinian Hamas movement, the Muslim Brotherhood movement in, in the Palestinian territories. They also were allies of Iran for a while, again, to uh, extend their influence in the region, ultimately with the aim of protecting the regime. So that's one aspect of the Iranian regime, which is that it operates as any regime does. It seeks to protect itself by extend, extending its influence in this region. There is, however, another aspect of the Iranian regime, which is that of a religious regime. It, it, uh, uh, its, its doctrine, its founding doctrine, is ultimately rooted in a, reli in a religious interpretation of, of Shiism, albeit not an orthodox interpretation, and they do use that doctrine to extend their influence as well uh, into Shia communities. Initially, the Iranians tried to use their revolutionary rhetoric to attract Sunnis to their, to their cause. That didn't work. The Sunnis did not were not attracted to Khomeini, Imam Khomeini's views for a number of complicated reasons, but including the fact that there was a Shia basis to those doctrines that was not appealing to the Sunnis. So the, the Iranian regime also uses Islam to promote its interests. And it has this double speak, the speak of a state and the speak of a revolutionary Islamic regime. And it's somehow, sometimes very difficult to disentangle the two from one another, the two aspects of this regime. What the Iranians do have, though, and this is where the religious uh, aspect does come in, is that the Iranians have an ability to project force. Beyond projecting influence politically, they have an ability to project force in the region. Because they have a, something called the Revolutionary Guard Corps. This is a, this is a kind of a, 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 military, a military ideological force that exists for the preservation of the regime. It, is, it operates beyond the borders of the regime. It has a very powerful sort of paramilitary capacity. They do use terrorism as an instrument of, uh, of, of power and policy projection. Uh, they are involved in the assassination of many 
uh, politicians in Iraq who oppose the regime in Iran, and they are also the key players in backing today the Assad regime in Syria. The Hezbollah in Lebanon is a integral part of the Re Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. Um, so they have that ability. Now, just in the two minutes I have left, let me tell you something about Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Saudi Arabia, which represents sort of the other side of the coin, Saudi Arabia is a regime that goes back to the 18th century. And its founding doctrine, which is often referred to as Wahhabism or Salafism, is premised on a visceral hatred of, other, of Muslims who are not like them, okay, basically. They don't like other Muslims, including Sunni Muslims, by the way, who are not like them. But they have a particular hatred for two groups. They hate the Shi'is, and they also hate people who visit graves. They have a thing about visiting graves. You're not supposed to visit graves, okay? And they destroy graves systematically and have historically done so. So the Wahhabis, or the Saudis, who are very strong allies of the United States, and for good reason, and may that remain, uh, are a regime that, again, like the Iran regime, has two sides or two aspects to it. You have a ruling family, known as the Al Saud, who are not religious clerics, who are in an alliance with a religious elite that supports this interpretation of Islam, this very strict, literalist interpretation of Islam. And the relationship between the religious and the secular rulers or the, uh, the, the royal family of, of Saudi Arabia is a, there's a symbiotic relationship there. And the Saudi rulers can invoke religion and can push religion if they need to. There's a famous saying, it's probably an ap apocryphal one, but the founder king of Saudi Arabia, who is a man called Abdul Aziz, known to the West as Ibn Saud, died in 1953, he said, he said, he's supposed to have said, religion is like a falcon. It's like a, you know, the bird that you hunt with. He says, religion is like a falcon. If you, the one who controls the falcon hunts with it. So he has used religion, and this regime has used religion for very pragmatic reasons, namely to protect and preserve the rule of the Saudi royal family. They've used it very effectively domestically, and they have mobilized this version of religion, especially after 1979, when they were threatened by an internal, there was an internal threat within the Saudi kingdom from, from, from Wahhabis who were even more extreme than the, than the mainstream Wahhabis, and also from the revolutionary uh, uh, Islamic regime in Iran. And they've mobilized their ideology and their version of Islam since then by promoting it and spending money on it and so on and establishing major universities that have taught a number of, I mean thousands of uh, students who have then propagated the faith, or that version of the faith uh, throughout the world. Now the Saudis, unlike the Iranians, cannot project force. They don't have the capacity to project force. They're very good at writing checks. They can write money, they can, send, they can give money to people, they can promote uh, support by giving money, but money doesn't buy loyalty in the Middle East. It can, if at best, it can temporarily buy you some time or some loyalty, but you don't, they don't have the equivalent of a revolutionary guard corps like the Iranians do. Uh, so their ability to project force is very limited unless they want to turn to the most sort of radical version of their faith, which is represented by Al-Qaeda. And the problem for Saudis with the use of Al-Qaeda is that they did that once in Afghanistan against the Soviets, and it created this monster that came back to haunt them. And I don't think they're willing to do that again. They've learned that lesson. So they're very reticent to use the very violent interpretation of Wahhabism or of Salafism to gain, uh, to gain uh, uh, sort of policy goals in the region. Uh, so they need the United States because the United States can project force in the region and they're terribly disappointed that President Obama has not used force to crush the regime of, of Assad in Syria. Now, what's going on in Syria, namely, that you have a minority group that is Shi'i and is in alliance with Iran, has become a killing machine. Syria is a human meat grinder. 
And it's a grinder that is grinding Sunnis, largely Sunnis, uh, on a daily basis with over 110,000 dead. This does not make for good copy in Saudi Arabia. The Saudi population is irate, is very angry about this. So are many Sunnis in, throughout the Muslim world. Because the regime in Syria has, in fact, used sectarianism to promote its own survival. It has used the policy of minorities, of rallying the minorities to itself, not just the Shias, but also the Christians, uh, to itself in order to guarantee its survival. And this has meant that the majority of the population in Syria, some 70% who are Sunnis, many of whom are at war and in rebellion against the regime, have been caught in this killing machine. And the Saudis are angry about this and want us to do something about it. And they're very limited in their own capacity to do something about it, except to spend money, which is what they're doing, a plenty. And they also see Syria as an opportunity to bleed Iran, to bleed Iran financially and militarily. And I think what we're seeing in, in Syria, and this is spoken from personal experience because I grew up and I lived through the Lebanese Civil War, is that we're seeing a kind of repeat of the Lebanese Civil War in Syria, although a much more vicious version of it, where you basically have a war that is convenient, ultimately, for many of the regional actors, as well as the international actors, a way in which they can settle scores with one another at the expense of the Syrian population. And this is the tragedy that is Syria today. And religion and sectarianism is part of it, but it's not the whole story. It's only one element, and it's being used instrumentally to propagate and to, to settle scores between these different regimes that, yes, have different ideological and sectarian uh, orientations, but it's not, it's not sect, and the difference between Sunnis and Shiism, while important, does not explain everything in this, in this war. Thank you. All right, now that that's clear, uh, I would ask uh, students who have questions to please uh, line up. While they are, uh, Professor Haeckel, I can ask the first question. <clears throat> if you could place on the roadmap, um, take Egypt as an example, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, a fundamentalist Sunni movement, yes. and the Salafists. Where, where, what's the difference between them? Okay. Um, so th do these work? Yes. Okay, so the Muslim Brotherhood is a Sunni movement, although the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, is, uh, un uh, unlike the Salafis, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood are a, an, a group that uses religion to to come to power. Their interest always has been to uh, come to power. And for them, uh, matters of theology and, and sectarian differences are of a second order in terms of importance, not of, unlike the Salafis, for whom, for instance, an alliance with, with uh, Sufis or an alliance with Shias would be impossible for doctrinal reasons. The Muslim Brotherhood wouldn't have such um, uh, such problems with the, creating those kinds of alliances. Now, the reason that the Saudis, uh, the Saudi regime dis detests the Muslim Brotherhood and has fought tooth and nail to get rid of it in Egypt, I think there are four or five reasons, if I may, just elaborate on why the Saudis are so uh, much against the Muslim Brotherhood. First, the Muslim Brotherhood is not doctrinally uh, sort of obsessed like the Salafis. And I think, this, the, I think the Saudis fear that if the Muslim Brotherhood were to come to power and remain in power, they could strike deals with Iran and with Shia countries, and that's not acceptable. The second reason is that the Muslim Brotherhood, if it were to come to power uh, and be successful, it would represent an, another model of uh, a use of Islam uh, in power that could compete directly with the Saudi version. And so they are competitors on the same playing field, if you like, with the Saudis. The third reason is that the Muslim Brotherhood is quite authoritarian and opaque in its internal structure, and therefore not, uh, ab you know, the, the Saudis are not able to control it. The fourth reason is that the Muslim Brotherhood has a presence in Saudi Arabia itself, 
and can mobilize, potentially, uh, to becoming the only force that can uh, threaten the Saudi regime domestically. And lastly, and this is a region with long memories, the Muslim Brotherhood sided with Saddam Hussein when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990 and not with Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. And that is an unforgivable crime. Okay, okay please. Hi, this is uh, for Professor uh, Haeckel. Um, so I guess my question is, does Saudi Arabia, does the Saudi Arabian regime kind of fear supporting um, Syrian rebels at the expense of supporting extremists from abroad? And are they willing? I know that um, a lot of private citizens from Saudi Arabia send money and arms to Syrian rebels. So are, is, the Syri or is the Saudi Arabian regime capable of stopping those flows of money and arms? And are they willing to do that? I'm, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm sure Dr. Abdul would have something to say about that as well. Uh, there, the, the, the support to the Syrian rebellion, which is a very divided and fractured rebellion with you know, Al-Qaeda elements and more Islamic nationalist elements. Um, the Saudis are, to the best of my knowledge, are avoiding the support to Al-Qaeda. They're not supporting Al-Qaeda. The support to Al-Qaeda is coming uh, from private citizens uh, from Kuwait, pr principally, uh, there's some massacres in, that happened in Syria that were actually deliberately um, uh, orchestrated from Kuwait uh, against Shias in Syria, uh, uh, but also private citizens in Qatar and in Saudi Arabia. Whether they can control those flows, I'm not sure, because a lot of those flows are actually in the form of cash with individuals carrying suitcases, and that's very difficult to control. Uh, the, the, I know the Saudis are very reticent to repeat the experience of Al-Qaeda, uh, and so therefore are not funding uh, Al-Qaeda. The Qataris, in interestingly enough, did not have the same scruples, ha were not as worried about the funding of Al-Qaeda. They just wanted to get rid of the regime of Assad and were willing to support a much broader uh, array of groups uh, in, in Syria. And I think the situation is still extremely unclear, um, because as far as the Saudis are concerned, much of their funding, they don't trust the Turks, so much of their funding is going through Jordan. And so the Jordanians have also a say over who gets uh, funded in, uh, in Syria. And it seems to me that much of the rebellion in the south of Syria is being Saudi-driven, much more than the rebellion, let's say, in the north. Thank you. Uh, he's, a uh, student. Student? he's a student. He is a, he's a former student. I'm a former student. student. Okay, counts. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little provocative and ask you this question. I tend to think that this has nothing to do about sectarianism. Uh, and even if we look at Sunni-Shia, I'm going to be very brief, even if we look at Sunni-Shia relationships, we're going to see that for decades, uh, even the Sunnis have seen Shia as another madhab like in Yemen. Yeah. They have even referred to them as Jafariya, right. never as Shia per se. Uh, also, uh, on the side of, of Iran, uh, Iran has uh, at a certain time um, carried the brand of nationalism that the liberation of Al-Quds would go through Karbala. And that, uh, after all, the revolution was about Mustad'afin, we're even in the discourse of the, of the French Revolution. So uh, my sense, and proof of that also in all this, this, this meat grinder which we see, this tragedy, at least they could be making the claim each side of converting people. They're not converting, they're exterminating people. Right. So uh, it, it's, 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 it's profoundly problematic. There's a, there's a deep contradiction with everything we've seen uh, throughout history. So my question to this is that this is clearly about a power struggle that has been that now uh, has a life of its own, but at the root, I would tend to think that this has nothing to do with sectarianism. It's just a marker, it's just a, an instrument or in the language, but. Okay. Please. I tend to disagree. Um, I think that certainly that is, the way you've laid this out is true historically, but the Arab uprisings, I think, have changed the situation 
for several reasons, one of which is, as you mentioned, this, this grab for power. But I want to also sort of emphasize um, the point I mentioned a few moments ago, which is that there, this power, this grab for power that you're describing, I believe exists on a state level, you know, as Bernard was explaining, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. But how it's interpreted in the grassroots level, on the grassroots level, is something different. To me, that is more sectarian in, its, its, in what's driving it. Um, and, you know, I used to, when I lived many years in the Middle East, I used to always joke because if you, if you went and, and spoke with Israelis and Palestinians, they would say, oh, but, you know, we're fighting now, but we used to go to each other's weddings. And all over the Middle East now, this is what the Shia and Sunni are saying, exactly what you described. In Bahrain, no one can understand how this ended up as a sectarian conflict, not primarily, but certainly in part. And the reason is that the state, the Bahraini state, created a self-fulfilling prophecy. They, when the uprising began, they, be, be, they began very powerful propaganda making the argument that the uprising was being led by Iran. And eventually, a large part of the Sunni population started believing it. Um, now, if you, if you go to Bahrain, you know, the Shia and the Sunni are sitting in separate restaurants. Um, they're self-segregating themselves in universities. There are divorces um, within, you know, mixed marriages. So, yes, this was not the case before and certainly was not how people I defined themselves, which is a good point that you made. But I think that the Arab uprisings have changed this and identity politics has become much more important. I mean, I, I, by the way, this is uh, His Royal Highness Mullah Hisham of Morocco, who's the benefactor of the Transregional Institute and someone who really knows what he's talking about. Um, I, I, I agree with you. Where I would sort of nuance what you said is this, is, is that once sectarianism becomes the language of politics, it has sort of a logic of its own. So, so, so that while it's true there are these regional rivalries, but once the Assad regime starts using sectarianism as a language, it forces people to uh, speak that way. And then there are consequences to speaking that way and to being that way. Uh, and once the Saudis are, do that as well, again, there are consequences to using that. It, it, in other words, sectarianism may not be at the root of the, of, the, of the differences, but once it becomes the grammar of politics, it has a logic that that, that is uh, extremely violent in its consequences and in its outcomes. Please. Thank you. Um, my question is, to what extent are the outside Shia groups, such as Hezbollah and uh, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, uh, militia from Iraq, fighting offensive operations in Syria against the rebel militias versus defending Shia communities and shrines like Sayyidah Zainab. You want to take that? Go ahead. I, I think they're doing both. I mean, I uh -huh. think they're doing both. The the uh, the recapture of this neighborhood in Damascus recently, and the recapture of uh, certain towns and villages along the Lebanese border, and also the base in Aleppo. This was an offensive move on the part of of the regime and its supporters from Hezbollah and the Shia brigade, which, by the way, is not just Iraqi; it's also Pakistan. Right. Okay. So I'll ask a question. To what extent uh, does the uh, animosity of the Saudi Wahhabi regime extend with respect to a possible alliance with or working together with Israel vis-a-vis -vis Iran? There are newspaper reports suggesting that under current circumstances, the Saudis being upset over the possibility of a, an accord, the Israelis being upset over the possibility of an accord, have found each other, at least surreptitiously, covertly, and may actually cooperate should Israel decide to launch a military attack. Are we talking about, to that extent, animosity could exist that would bring these two countries together, or are there going to be inhibitors in that? Well. I wouldn't say that it's bringing these two countries together, but I mean, clearly, um, I think that both countries are trying to find options given the fact that a deal seems somewhat inevitable. 
Um, and, you know, the, I mean, the, the Iranian, the Iranians have played this really well, I think. And they've, I mean, at least according to, to White House officials, one of the reasons that there was not an attack on Syria was because President Obama knew he, that that would sabotage any sort of progress on the nuclear negotiations. And that's something, of course, that the Saudis and the Israelis really were, were hoping for. So I think that as time goes on, they're seeing the door closing, the window closing to a deal. And I mean, there are some Israeli sources that even predict that perhaps the Israelis might attack Iran you know, or in their nuclear facilities in the interim before a deal is made or even after a deal is made. Um, so, I mean, I, I see that there's a, a sort of a, an, you know, an identity of interest, if you like, or, uh, you know, there are parallel interests right now. Uh, but ultimately, there are some very significant differences between Israel and Saudi Arabia. So if I may focus on them just for a minute. I think Israel is obsessed principally uh, with the nuclear um, uh, project that Iran has. I, I think that's an important consideration for the Saudis, but it's not at the core of what bothers Saudi Arabia. What bothers Saudi Arabia is that they see Iran as meddling in Arab affairs. They want to roll back Iranian influence from the Palestinian arena, the Lebanese arena, the Syrian arena, and the Iraqi arena, which is a tall order. Uh, they, they would like to see that um, they would like to see Iran, um, you know, sort of very seriously diminished in its capacity to project influence and power in the region. Uh, whereas I don't think that the Israelis are bothered by the Iranians in Iraq necessarily, or for that matter in Syria, because the Assad regime wasn't particularly bothersome. Uh, it, Hezbollah is another matter. Hamas is another matter. Uh, so, so there are differences uh, on, on that, in that respect. Um, I, I think also that from the Saudi perspective, a strike on Iran, whilst theoretically desirable, would in fact incapacitate uh, Saudi electricity, desalination, and possibly oil production in the eastern province because the Iranian uh, strategic and military posture is such that they would fire thousands of missiles at eastern Saudi Arabia, which could you know, be very seriously uh, debilitating to the Saudi economy and even Saudi life, because desalination is how the Saudis survive. Um, so I, I'm not sure. You know, I think that, and I'm also not sure whether the Saudis and the Israelis see eye to eye on Syria. Uh, you know, I don't see that they agree on and on what the, what the good outcome in Syria would be. So uh, whilst there might be communication and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, a, a mutuality of interests, um, I think ultimately, though, I cannot see the Saudis really either covertly or overtly cooperating with the Israelis, not least also because it would delegitimize the Saudi regime in the eyes of Arab and Islamic publics. Please. Yeah, hi. Can you just say a few words about the history of any kind of mobility between the two communities, Shia and Sunni, yeah. uh, both in the far past as well as moving toward the present, yeah. conversions into marriages? How has that all come about and where is that going? You want to take it? Yeah. Okay, the most beautiful story of, of Shia Sunni mobility is, uh, is, is one that comes from Lebanon. So the Shias, uh, uh, unlike the Sunnis, uh, if a man, if a father, has only daughters, in Shiaism, the daughters would inherit fully from, from the father. Whereas in Sunnis, uh, the daughters would only inherit partially, and the parallel male cousins and uncles would get a large portion of the inheritance. So repeatedly in Lebanon, uh, we've had, including a prime minister who is a Sunni, uh, who only had daughters, and they would always convert to Shiaism. In order, to, in order to deny the rest of the family the inheritance. So, so that's, I think that's the sweetest story in, in, the, in, in, that, in that respect. Um, but in terms of conversions, you know, much of southern Iraq, the tribes of southern Iraq, are recent converts to Shiism. This is not an ancient Shia community. The tribes, not the cities. 
the kind of rural, the, the, the hinterland of southern Iraq. It's a 19th century story, uh, largely. Uh, so, you know, you, you, and, and by the way, the, the, when, just to come back to the Saudis for a second, you know, the, the closest ally in Iraq to the Saudis is not a Sunni. It's Iyad Alawi, who is a Shi'i, but a secular Shi'i, uh, who also has Saudi citizenship, by the way. Um, so, so it's not, you know, the, 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 the idea that, you know, uh, and, and this goes back to the point that Mullah Hisham was making, the idea that somehow um, Sunnis and Shi'is are oil and water and they never mix is not true. Uh, you do have instances of mixing, you do have instances of intermarriage. In Lebanon, for the longest time, there was never an issue between Sunnis and Shi'is, uh, really, socially. Um, but, you know, politics has a way of making these cleavages look very nasty. Please. Well, I have to admit to a fair amount of confusion about all of this, but I'm, I'm trying to, to learn. One, uh, one thing that has confused me is that um, Saddam Hussein's regime was a Sunni regime. Saudi Arabia is Sunni, and yet Saudi Arabia supported us in the invasion. I, I'm curious as to why. And my second question is I really had no idea that, the, the, uh, that it was a 90-10, 87-13 split. And how, it, and how it can be such a serious conflict when the numbers are so skewed in one direction. You want to take that? Well, I mean, I think that the reason that the, that the Saudis supported the U.S. is that no one expected the outcome that we have today. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think that, that it was presumed that it would be a Sunni-led government that would be in power in, in Iraq. Um, and regarding your second question, I mean, it, it's a... It's sort of the story across the Middle East. I mean, how can an Alawite minority in Syria rule over so many Sunni? Um, in the case, and every country has a different history. I mean, in the case of Syria, you know, the, the, when Syria was colonized, it was the French that promoted the Alawites. The Maronites were promoted in Lebanon, who are also a minority. Um, and this is, to some degree, why there was a civil war in Lebanon, because um, you know, a small minority ruled the country, and that wasn't acceptable for the majority. So in some sense, although it seems illogical, that seems to be the story of some Middle Eastern countries. I mean, in Bahrain, how can a minority Sunni population rule over a Shia population that's almost 70% of the population? And that's because of history. It's because uh, the Khalifa family came to power in Bahrain. I mean, yeah, if I could just follow up on the first part of it. Uh, d there's a, there's a uh, Shia majority in, in Iraq, did, did they not expect that, that that Shia majority would in some way have a lot of influence when all this was over? The Saudis? Yeah, I mean, f firstly, you know, Saddam Hussein, whilst the Sunni, did not rule as a Sunni. I mean, he didn't rule under, you know, he, he wasn't using Sunnism as uh, the, his legitimizing ideology. He, he ruled as a secular nationalist, pan-Arab nationalist called a Ba'athist, okay? And uh, I don't think he cared much for Islam or, or about Islam. He only did very late in the day and for uh, reasons that remain, you know, obscure. Um, th this, so the Saudis uh, thought of him as an Arab nationalist and they goaded him and, and supported him when he fought against Iran because it was convenient for them to have Iran, especially revolutionary Iran, uh, uh, you know, sort of weakened by that. Um, the, the Americans, when the Americans came to, to Iraq in 2003, they kind of adopted a logic of, a kind of a crude logic, which is they looked at the numbers, they thought, okay, well, you know, it's this, so many of these, so many of those, and so many of that, and electoral politics would be based on the numbers, on a numbers game. Rather than looking at other possibilities, they could have thought of regions and regional identity as the basis of a political affiliation or ideology as a basis for political affiliation. But they immediately gravitated towards sectarianism as the, as the kind of grammar for politics. And that, again, going back to the point I was making earlier, is that when you accept that that is the way you, a country's politics are going to be structured, there are consequences to that, to that, to, to that uh, you know, way of thinking and way of structuring things. And, the, the, and when, you, when you think that Shias are always going to be 
ruling as Shi'is and Sunnis are not because they're the minority, it prevents cross-cutting, you know, cross-cutting sort of networks from forming cross sects. A cross sects. This is the problem of Lebanon. In Lebanon, when you walk into an, an, a government office, there are three desks. There's a Sunni desk with an official behind it. There's a Shi'i desk with a Shi'i official behind it, and a Christian guy behind his desk. And if you come as a Lebanese and you're pleading to the, you're pleading to the government, you have to know which desk to go to based on who you are. I mean, imagine if we did this, you know, you went to the post office here and you were an African American, you had to go to the African American. It's absurd. But that's how it works in, in a country like that. And that prevents nationalism from forming. If I could add one. I think also, and perhaps you might disagree, but I think another big factor in why um, sectarianism is to some degree characterizing a lot of these societies is because the role of religion today, it, it, because religion plays a much greater role in some Arab societies today than it did in the days of pan-Arabism. Um, and, you know, certainly we've seen that in Egypt. I mean, how did the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, come to power to begin with? Um, I don't, I think that religion played a role in that. I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood was largely responsible for Islamizing Egyptian society. And maybe that's in reverse now, given everything that's happened and the, the military coup. But I think that we can't discount the fact that some Arab societies, you know, have become a lot more religious than they were, say, 20 years or 20 years, 30 years ago. Yeah. There is also one other point that you need to keep in mind. When you have authoritarian regimes that rule countries for three, four, five decades, and these authoritarian regimes are afraid of their own societies, where you cannot form a bicycle, you know, fan club, or a butterfly collecting club, a stamp club, a, you know, there's no, no clubs, no, it's not permitted. No form of civic association is permitted except for religion because you can't shut down mosques. If they could shut down mosques, they would shut them down, but they can't. So religion has flourished in, because, I think in, in, in good part, because these, uh, these regimes have not allowed sort of other forms of, of civic association from forming. As a result, you have a political desert in these countries. There's nothing there but religion in some sense uh, to gravitate to, and we are, sort of living with the consequences of such bad governance over so many decades. And in Libya, by the way, is the example of this. Because there you had a regime that deliberately prevented institutions from forming. It was a lunatic, you know, run by a lunatic, uh, you know, who thank God is now dead, and has deliberately deinstitutionalized the country. With your permission, one more question, please. Uh, yeah, actually, might sneak in another one, but uh, related to your discussion of the of the dimension of religious uh, factionalism as opposed to, let's say, geographical or other uh, other components. To what extent, and uh, is this equal among Shia and Sunni? Uh, well, I guess it wouldn't be. But to what extent is resentment against Iran? Uh, based on Arab versus non-Arab as opposed to religious grounds. And, uh, uh, There's another one? Well, uh. the, the other one is entirely a, a different dimension. To what extent is there a generational gap? I, I think we've seen signs, you know, in, in Egypt, we've seen signs in the past in Iran of a very different attitude toward religiosity and so forth among the, uh, a much more secular feeling among many, many of the younger people. Uh, and to what extent does, is, is this likely to play into all of these affairs? Do you want to sure, I'll just briefly answer the first part. I, from my experience of living in both Arab societies and in Iran, where I lived for three years, um, I think that the Iranians have much more of a problem with the Arabs than the Arabs have with the Persians. <laughs> Because the Iranians consider themselves, I mean, this is just, of course, generalization, but because they, had a, they have a long history, they have, a, you know, they, they consider themselves more educated and intellectual than, Ara than the Arabs. They consider themselves as coming from a long and, and, you know, influential civilization. The Arabs, I think, don't view the Iranians in the same sense. Um, the Arabs, it, it always struck me because I would leave Tehran and go to Cairo and, the Egyptians had no idea what was going on in Iran. Um, I mean, this was in the late 90, 1990s. 
But the Iranians have always, because of the, the, the reasons that Bernard mentioned, the Iranians have always had their eye on the Arab world. I mean, that's, they derive a lot of their sort of legitimacy, um, both in religious terms and political terms. Um, you know, the first thing that Khamenei said, and still says it today about the Arab uprisings, is that this is a pan-Islamic awakening. So the Iranians have always had their eye on Sunni societies, but I don't think that that has ever been true for the Arabs. Um, the Arabs have been, I think, very sort of not all that attentive um, in terms of you know, the, the, the identity of the Iranians until recently, of course, until the Arab uprisings. Um, and, and, they've all, and, and despite all attempts to export the revolution, of course, that, that didn't happen. Yeah, I, I mean the, I mean that uh, divide between you know Persian and Arab is an important one, but I, I think it's it's uh, it's something that from the Arab side you you hear a lot uh, a lot more of recently. I mean, a lot of anti Shi'is are arguing not only that the Shia are not Muslims, but in fact that it's a Persian pre-Islamic conspiracy to destroy Islam itself, right? And, and uh, I don't know how, you know, how many people buy into that view. I mean, certainly in Saudi Arabia amongst the Salafis, that's a prevailing view. But the Arab-non-Arab the, the -Arab divide is an important one, but I don't know if it really explains much of the politics, um, except at the level of uh, vilification and rhetoric. It's important rhetorically. The generational one is a, more, is a more important one. I mean, in many Arab societies, 70% of the population, sometimes more, is under the age of 30. Um, and what these young people are thinking, many of them are, of course, frustrated professionally because they can't get jobs, have very high unemployment rates. Um, these are very conservative societies uh, in terms of sexual and social mores. So I think there's a lot of frustration uh, um, that's there in the societies to begin with, largely because they're so poorly run, so poorly managed, and because their economies that are, are at a standstill, like in Egypt, for instance. And what worries me with these young people is not only are they, many of them going to try to emigrate and try to leave, uh, but if they try to effect change and they see that political change is not possible through peaceful means, they will resort to violence. And so I suspect that the next round of uprisings uh, will be much, much more violent than, than what we saw in 2000, late 2010 and 2011. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Dr. Jeanette Abdel, Professor <laughs> Hitler.